we, most of us know Peter, and uh, uh, we have had some various thoughts about Peter, and I want to unpack that a little bit more. But while this is not connected to the chosen video series, I, I'm telling you, I love this scene. I want to show you from the chosen. It's G Peter's encounter with Jesus, the first encounter that he had. And, and by the way, this is free, and, and on the bottom of your notes... There, they gave us permission. So on the bottom of your notes, there's a QR code. Take your phone, put it on camera, aim it at that little square down there, and it'll take you straight to Angel Studios, and you can watch the entire series free. We, listen, I have watched this thing five, six, seven times through. I read the Bible every day. I pray every day. That's just what I do. It's part of my, part, part of my rhythm of life. But sometimes I realize that I can read and my brain is not necessarily engaged. Come on, somebody else in here like that? Help me out, folks. And uh, I, I, don't re I don't watch the series kind of like in place of the Bible, but it warms my heart every time. There's a grace upon this, this series that I think will really help you and bless you. And maybe you'll, if you've not seen it, maybe this will help encourage you. It doesn't replace the Bible, but it surely supplements it pretty well. So would you roll that for us? And let's, let's watch Peter as he encounters the, Jesus for the first time. I'm Jesus. Thanks for this. Sam. In my last moments with you, I want to share another story. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Well, let's thank our friends for this strong boat, huh? Trust me, my yelling voice is not easy on the ears. Because I'm on this boat, my final parable should be about fishing, yes? Simon, please send me that net. When this net is thrown into the sea, what happens, Simon? Well, I mean most of the time. <laughs> it gathers. A, a little louder. It gathers fish. Yes. This net gathers fish. All kinds of fish, yes? Yes. All kinds of fish. And the kingdom of heaven is like what happens next. After the net is full, Simon and the others draw it to the shore, sit down, and sort out the fish. The good fish go into the barrels, and the bad fish thrown away. So it will be at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. Do you understand? Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, like you all are now, is like the master of a house who brings forth his treasures, both new and old. You are to do the same with this knowledge. These parables I tell Makes sense to some, not to others. Be patient. That is all for today. I have some business to attend to with my new friend. that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word.
I told you. I told you. I told you. My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. Now, I could have told you that story, right? But, yeah, I'm wiping tears myself, and I've seen it a dozen times, at least this week. Follow me. I don't know, but I think maybe, in fact, let's just do this. In, in your notes, there's a, there's a little grid. It's not a test, by the way, but it, it, it will help you, I think, because like Simon... God calls us where we are. So men, especially men, because this is Father's Day month, and you already had your Father's Day message, so especially men. But if you're a man, hand and your wife's with you, or you've got a friend or a sister, hand this to someone else. Let them grade you on this. And let's just go through this grid and see how you stack up to Simon pre-Jesus. So first of all, Simon is a man. Any men in here? Come on, that's an easy one. That, you, you get that one, right? I mean, oh, that's, just, that's me. Simon was a son. If you're a man and you're born, you were a son. Simon was a brother. You're thinking, oh, this is one of those crip courses now. No, 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 just stay with me. Next of all, Simon was a husband. Not all of us are husbands, but some of us are, many of us are. Simon was a fisherman. How many of you like to fish? I don't like to fish. I love to catch, though, right, Josh? I hate it when we go fishing and all we're doing is feeding the fish. I love to cat. I like that last part. That's the kind of fishing I always envision as I pull away from the, the, the bank and come back and I'm like the, you know, the Simon afterwards, like, why did I even bother, right? Just, just feeding the fish. Secondly, or not secondly, but you know, Simon was a hard worker. How many of you feel like you're hard workers? Come on. You can, you, you can be a male or female. Raise your hand on that one. You surely are. Hard workers. Here's another one. Simon was a country boy. Wasn't, wasn't from the city. He was just kind of ordinary. In fact, around here, he'd have been from Deep River, somewhere like that, you know. We know that because over in Acts, when he's preaching the first time, someone says, who is this guy? What's he doing? He can't even talk proper. He's a hillbilly. Anyway, uh, we're not hillbillies, but he's a country boy. Simon was ambitious. Go ahead and check that off if you've ever had any ambition in you. But what about this? Simon was also fairly rash. He often spoke without thinking. If you follow Simon Peter's life in the Gospels, you see that over and over again. He was a bit mouthy. In fact, there was one time when Jesus, when he, just after he betrayed Jesus, which is another one on this list, someone said, come on, I know you were with Jesus, and he starts cussing. He starts swearing, and I'm not like, I, take, I swear an allegiance. No, man, he was using some fisherman words, I think. But anyway, he was stubborn. He had an anger issue on the night Jesus was betrayed. He whipped out a sword and cut Malchus's ear off. Malchus was the servant to the high priest. He had a little bit of an anger problem. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's not one of you will raise your hand. Look at you. Lie. Okay, one. Okay, thank two. All right, great. My hand's up. I'm going to confess it before God. 
He was a betrayer. I want to ask you to raise your hand on that one. He betrayed Jesus. Ultimately, Simon saw himself when he met Christ, but even at the end, after Christ was crucified, he felt that he was an utter failure, unworthy of the call to be Christ's follower, much less his friend or special ambassador. his apostle, one that is sent to share with others. You see, he, he, here's the next thing I want you to look at, the next grid, and, and, and realize that this is the same Peter, but it's, it's a change. It, it's Simon who's been transformed. The DNA is the same, but his spirit man has been changed, and he is now new. Jesus said to him, I've chosen you. Jesus called him a rock. This is the same guy that cussed at the at the, at the trial of Jesus's trial. This is the same guy that said, I never knew him. This is the same guy that cut the ear off. He was loyal. Jesus said of him that he was a loyal friend. He was a confidant. Jesus pulled him into the inner circle and shared things with he and James and John that not everybody else got an opportunity to share. By the way, if you didn't get notes when you walked through, raise your hand and somebody will get those to you. I apologize for waiting so late to remind you about that. He was a man of faith. He didn't feel like he was. How many of you would say, even in your walk, I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and yet there's still days when I feel like my faith falters and fails, especially when circumstances are not ideal. It doesn't feel like God's real. Remember that? But he was also repentant. He was forgiven, and he was transformed He wasn't transformed instantaneously, but God began working in him, revealing, building faith, building understanding. And even when you thought he had it all right, he still blew it, as we do many times. But it didn't change Christ's position or opinion of him. He was trusted. He was resilient. He was a shepherd. Jesus made him shepherd of the flock. Feed my sheep was his last words to Peter, who now is an apostle an apostle, one who was chosen, empowered, and sent to represent Christ as an ambassador. See, the difference, the difference in Simon and Peter is not just the names. The difference is that though Christ called him unchanged, called him unqualified, called him while he was still uncouth, the difference is that Christ called him. And in his calling began to move him into a place of being qualified. Jesus called Peter just as he was, crafty, (laughs) surly, (laughs) all that. And I love that scene where Peter falls at his feet and confesses, I'm a sinful man. It reminds me of this old hymn. It was a hymn, in fact, they sang and Tramway Baptist Church, and it's 100 years ago, it feels like now. It was just actually, you know, some 50 years ago. And I, as a little boy, walked down that aisle as they sang, Just As I Am. You remember that song? Some of you do. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Sometimes when I'm in prayer, I just sing that, and I come fresh to God. Not to be born again, again, and again, and again, but to remind myself that He didn't call me because I was good. He didn't call me because I would one day be a pastor, a church planter, or a missionary, any of that. He called me because He loved me. (laughs) Simple, plain. I don't understand it. I can't explain it fully. I owe that I could I will try today, but it is a reality. It is a biblical truth, just as I am. (laughs) Though tossed without, listen, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fighting and fears within and without, O Lamb of God, I come. Jesus Christ did not come for me. 
He did not come for Peter because of what we could do for him, but he called us, and because he called us, he chose to save us and to use us. So let's continue to unpack 1 Peter here a little bit. I want to look at, we looked at Peter, the, the one who was called. I want to go to verse 1b, if you will, and this is where Peter says, I'm writing to God's chosen people. If you've got a pen with you, uh, you want to just circle that word chosen if you, ha- if you can. And uh, he, got, he says, I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. By the way, that is modern Turkey. It's down in that area where Ephesus is. It's it's where Sardinus is and all the seven churches of Revelation. They're all in that same location. After after the, the persecution and after the war that took place in Jerusalem, all the the, the, not only the Christians, but Jews in general, fled the area. They were driven out, and many of them moved to what we call Asia Minor, and uh, they were down in the areas of Turkey and, and all through the Black Sea region. They were all scattered, peppered in there. We call that the diaspora. Diaspora, diaspora. But I want you to look at that word chosen several weeks ago. Actually, several months ago now, we did a series called Church in the Wild, and we talked about this word chosen, and it's where Jesus in Matthew 16 says that I will build my church, and this word church is ecclesia, or it means to be the called out, and here this word chosen is ecclesat, which means those that I've chosen, that I've called unto myself. I'm writing to those that I've called to myself. This is a a Greek word in in, in the New Testament, but it's a word that is almost 100%, almost, almost exclusively used in reference to being called to God, selected, not by choice. It's not, I love this commercial, you've probably seen it, it's, it's called The Easiest Decisions of All Decisions in the World, and it's five kids on a, on a playground basketball court, and there's there's three or four kids getting ready, and they're all standing there like, like, you know, like you did at seven, eight, ten years old, ready to be picked, you know, hoping, you know, you kind of put your best face on and your game face, hoping that, and Charles Barkley's in the crowd, and the first kid that picks chooses Barkley, like that's a, you know, seven foot tall NBA star, you know, it's like it's the easiest decisions among all decisions. It's not like that. It's, he didn't choose him because of your great ability. He chose you because he chose you. In fact, I love what the Scripture says. It says that, 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 that Christ, that, that the God of this world, when he crucified Christ, if he had known what God planned, he would have never done it. He had no choice because, listen to me, the devil is not his own free moral agent. He is a servant to God. He was created by God, and he will complete what God now has ordained for him to do. And part of his job was to crucify, to move upon the people's heart, and they crucified Christ. But had he known that killing Jesus was the best thing he could do for you and I. Why? Because that paved the way. It satisfied the wrath and anger of God and put us in right standing with him. If we receive that blood, if we receive that call and respond to him, that is amazing. I love what my friend Pastor Venar says in Chapel Hill at Grace Church. He says, God chooses you and chose me broken disqualified unqualified incapable he chooses us and makes us trophies of his grace think about that it's not what you do for God it's what God is doing in and through you he took you a lump of clay forgive me but he took you he took me And then he he begins to do this work in us, this transformation in us. He takes us like Peter, old cussing sailor, just, you know, kind of a mess. And God works in him and makes him the chief spokesman for the church in just four years. It's amazing. But it's a transformation that can only take place by the Holy Spirit being applied to our lives. Isn't that good? Listen, I'm getting born again just preaching this message. Oh, I'm telling you. Now, this word chosen, this ecclesia, I want to open up a couple of things about doctrine for you, theology, because theology is simply the knowledge of God. And whether you you believe it or not, you already have a theology. And, you know, some of us have a theology like, for example, mm, cleanliness is next to godliness. How many of you ever heard that? 
How many ever believe that? <laughs> That's what we call folk theology or foolish theology. But anyway, we believe stuff about God that's not true. We believe stuff about God and we apply that to God, therefore we apply it to ourselves and we get stuck because we don't understand the gospel, the good news. And this idea of being chosen is part of that, I believe. And and so I want to talk to you just real quickly, briefly about the doctrine of election. You see, this idea refers to this idea of election. In fact, if you read this in the King James, New King James, International Version, and I, I regret it after I put the sermon together. I didn't put it on the board for you, but, but here's the thing. It, it, it uses the term, he says, I write not to the chosen, but to the elect of God. To the elect of God. And it refers to God who is sovereign, sovereign God, who determined who would be called and who would not be called. God determined who would be saved and who would not be saved. God made that determination. Brian, could you bring me that bottle of water right there, please? Thank you. God determined that. Listen, if you're online and listening to me, don't don't turn out. Don't thank you so much, buddy. Don't turn away while I take a sip of water. But I want you to get this. It's not because you go to church. It's not because you give money. It's not because you read your Bible. You can be loyal to God, tick off all the boxes, and still not be in love with Him, still not be connected to Him, still not be part of His family, because you haven't responded to His call. Election is not something we do. It's not something that's dependent upon us. It's totally dependent upon us him now if you if you're struggling in your walk with christ you're feeling like you're not listen maybe you maybe you like me at seven years old made a decision to follow jesus and you have had a broken road one of those country songs you know like this look like a serpent i had that i lived that i still struggle with things in my life but here when you begin to understand that my election is not based upon my selection but his and my sanctification my 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 qualification my growing up in him becoming mature that requires me to be responsible but he's the one that's going to work philippians 1 6 says this he says i am confident of this paul says the god who called you that same god he will perfect what he called you for and to now listen if you like me, struggle with worry or struggle with anxiety or struggle with feeling like you're not worthy or feeling like you'll never match up or never measure up, this is good news. This is great news. This is the gospel. The gospel, simply put, is that God loved me when I was unlovable and chose me when I should have otherwise have been rejected. That's good news. Now, some of us, in our attempt to understand this, there's another Another approach to this, and we call this conditional election. Now, conditional election is something many of you probably have embraced, whether you meant to or knew it or was taught this or whatever, but I just want to show you how it shifts the picture. Conditional election says this. It says, God chose me because he knew eventually I would choose him. How many of you ever thought that or been told that? You've been told, listen, I'm guilty of telling people this because you're trying to explain it. And you say, well, you know, how can everybody be saying, how can you know who's going? And, and you say, well, God knew in the beginning of time, he knew that eventually you would accept him. And therefore, he called you, he elected you. But, but here's what happens with that. It's a very subtle change, subtle difference. It took me a long time to understand this because I lived in this conditional election most of my life. And here's what the difference is. If it's conditional based upon the fact that I will one day choose him, it shifts the, it pivots the good news and it's now back on my shoulders. God chose me because he knew eventually I would choose him and eventually I would be good enough to earn my salvation. That is what goes against what the scripture teaches. Does that make sense to you? And if you've been living under that, like I did for so many years, I remember in the morning I would jump out of bed. 
I would jump out of bed at 5.30 in the morning, not because I just love rising early, but fear would seize my heart. I'd jump out of the bed, my heart beating, and I'd, I'd want to get right to prayer. Why? I did not want to displease God. Now, I still do that, but I now do it not out of a fear that somehow I will displease God and God will, he'll make up his, he'll, you know, he's mostly mad anyway. That's, a, that's kind of the way you feel. And he's mostly sad. I got stuck with Tom. And so he's just waiting for an excuse to unload me, you know, put, give him to the other team. No, that's not the way God is at all. And now I would get out of bed and I would jump on my knees and I'm like, oh God, oh God. And man, I'd pray some loud and tearful and I still weep when I pray because I'm in the presence of the one who loved me even when he knew me and knew how unlovable I was. My wife has told me how unlovable I can be because I can be selfish. Anybody else feel that way? I can have anger issues. Anybody else feel that way? And sometimes my anger is not at her. Sometimes it goes to God. I don't understand why I got sick. I don't understand why someone died. I don't understand why a prayer isn't answered immediately. And I start jostling in my brain trying to figure out, well, if I'm not worthy, am I worthy of any of it? Does this make any sense or is this just for me? Maybe I just need to get born again again. But it's a reality. We need to preach the gospel to us every day and remind myself it is not because I can preach well because I preach too long. It's not because I'm good looking, though I am. It's, I know you're like, and a liar. (laughs) So so self deceived. That's the problem with deception, right? We don't know we're deceived. But anyway, it's not because of anything I'll ever do for him, it's because he chose me. And in fact, he chose me probably because I was the least savable. The enemy thought, I don't even have to worry about Tom. He knows my history. He knows my family. He knows all the stuff they did. Therefore, I'm going to be just like some of them. I'm not saying that in judgment to them. I'm just saying God knew. And God saved me anyway. And I... Now when I pray, sometimes I struggle with prayer, you know, tr- struggle getting started and feeling, not feeling worthy, but just finding the words. And sometimes I just sit and I have coffee with Jesus. Now that sounds pretty spiritual, I know. But what that means is I just sit with my Bible open and I read, maybe read a psalm and I just think about him. And I sip my coffee and I, I talk with him casually, like a friend talks with a friend. Because he chose me because he wanted me to be his friend, his child, his son. I don't have to please him, and I don't have to even use King James. Can you imagine how thankful I was when I realized that he didn't speak King James, and I didn't have to speak Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek? Man, I flunked that in seminary. So I was really thankful when I realized it's not based on anything I will ever do, but what he has already done for me. Now listen, if you're struggling with victory in your walk, if you're struggling with embracing and doing the things God's, you think God's called you to do, maybe it's because you're trying to be a doer and not be his friend, not enjoy the relationship. He didn't save you for what you could ultimately do for him. He saved you because you needed saving. And that is our first big idea for the day. I want you to fill this in. The big idea is simply this. God chose you. In fact, let's have some fun with this. Turn to the person next to you and just say it. God chose you. A little louder, please. Come on. God chose you. Now turn to somebody else. Turn to a total stranger because there's some strange people here today. Turn to a stranger. God chose you. And not one of you looked at me and said, God chose me. Come on now. (laughs) Hey, now let's say, let's say it together with a loud voice online. Let's say it with me now. Come on. God chose you. Now let's make it personal. God, come on. God chose me. Let's do it again. God chose me. That just makes my heart fit just as I am without one plea. I come to thee. Lamb of God, I come. God chose me. He chose you. Because he wanted to. (laughs) I love it. I could probably stop right there, but I won't. Okay.
All right, First Peter, because we haven't even, we just covered one verse. I can't let you go home with just one verse. You're like, want your money back or something. Come on. Look, 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 look at me at this next verse now. First Peter 1, verse 2. Now look at this. <laughs> I love this. God the Father knew you. <laughs> just, just put a period right there. God the Father knew you. He knew everything about you. I don't have to reiterate that because I spent a lot of time on that already. And chose you long ago. He chose you long ago, and his spirit made you holy. Not the fact that you read your Bible, not the fact that you ran down to the altar, not the fact that you picked up snakes or did anything else that you might have heard was what real spiritual people do. No, it was because he chose you. Before you chose him, he chose you. In fact, the only reason you can choose him is because he gave you the gift of faith. He opened your heart to believe. He opened your eyes to see. And you said, you didn't understand it, but you said, just like Peter in that video clip, I will follow you. And in that moment, that's why I, t- you know, I pray a very simple prayer at the end, and I'll do it in just a few minutes. Very simple prayer. Here's how you invite Jesus in. It's simple because he does all the work. He does all the work. And he will complete the work that he started in you. Jeremiah, and you've heard this verse many, many times. I say it all the time because I believe it with all my heart. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 he said it this way, I knew you, God speaking through Jeremiah the prophet, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you before your mother and father came together and you were conceived, I knew who you would be. You see, God is, I'll get to that in just a minute, before you were born, I set you apart and called you, appointed you as a prophet to the nations. He's speaking now to Isaiah. But to you and I, that truth still applies before you were born. Now, sometimes we want to put a punctuation mark there, a pause, and say, God, if you knew me before I was born, then why in the heck did all this stuff happen to me? Why was I abused? Why why was I uh, molested? Why was I raped? Why was I abandoned? Why was I adopted? And we have a long list of whys. God, if you knew all that stuff, why? Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. We live in a fallen world. God didn't do those things to you. Those things were done to you by and because of the sin that rules and reigns in this world. God didn't stop the bad stuff, but he promises that which Satan meant to destroy you, to make you unworthy, to make you unacceptable, to make you invalid. God says, I will turn that around, and what the enemy thought would be your cross to die on, he would execute your spirit, he would execute your soul, he would execute your reputation. God says, I will turn that around and make that your resurrection point. And because of me, that which was unlovable, that which was unsavable, will be saved and changed and transformed and will be a representative of me, and I will march you through the earth as a trophy of my grace, a trophy of my love, a trophy of what God can do when he takes the messed up and transforms them. Come on, church, help me out here. I hope it's because you're eating and got your mouth full. Now, this does not in any way, and I don't want you to think this, it does not in any way alleviate our responsibility to respond to God. In fact, that's the very root of the word response, to respond, to respond to God. And it takes more than just saying, I will. It takes a I will every day. Not of getting saved every day, but of choosing his lordship. Lord, you're going to be the Lord of all in my life. Because if he's not Lord of all, then I question if he's Lord at all. Some of us shake hands with Jesus and we just want to be his fan. And as long as he's winning, we're on the board. You know, like hurricanes, go hurricanes. Now it's like, go Rangers. It's like we change teams, just like that. I love the way the apostle Paul put this in Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read it to you, verses 4 through 10. I didn't put this on the board, but listen to it. But God is so rich in mercy. (laughs) But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much 
that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Not because you chose him, not because eventually you would, not because you sing purdy or you give money into, to the church, not because you run to sound. Thank you for doing that. Don't stop, by the way. But listen, it's not that. Because he chose you. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in, heavenly, in the heavenly realms because we are uh, uh, united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth. God is pointing out and saying, look what I did here. Look what I did there. These are the trophies. of. This is what my grace can do. This is what my power can do. Oh, that didn't happen in seminary. That happened when the Holy Spirit filled you and changed and transformed you. You don't have to go to Bible school to get that. You just have to go to prayer school to get that. Are you listening to me? You have to get the Bible into your heart. But God is the one that does that. We are seated with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth, of his grace, of his kindness toward us. As shown in all that he has done for, you, for us and all who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved us by his grace when you believed and you, can, you can't take credit for that. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. Rather, none of us can boast about it. For God, for we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do good works, good things, that he planned for us to do even before we were born. I love that. I love that. God did it all. That's why Jesus was able to proclaim, God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only son, <laughs> that whosoever would believe in him would be saved, would not perish but have eternal life. But we looked at the parable of uh, or the, the character of Jesus, uh, of Peter, for just a moment. But I want to look a little bit at the character of God as well. Because, again, we all have a theology, a belief system about God. It impacts everything we say and do. It impacts our worldview. And so I just want to look at it just for, just for a second. There's a grid there that says God is. I'm not going to go through all of that. Wouldn't have time. And I know that you're smart enough to read that, so I won't. But just a couple of them that I would like to, to just touch. First one simply says, God is eternal. God is eternal. Why is that important? Because God has no beginning, no end. He had no starting point, no ending point. In fact, God is outside of time. The only reason we celebrate time, same reason we celebrate birthdays, is because you and I are trapped in time. We are going to die. So from the moment that you're born... You were born on, Jan on June 5th. Every year you celebrate, hey, I made it around the sun one time without dying. We had a first birthday, and then our second birthday, and then our third birthday. We made it another year. We're not really celebrating our birthday. We're celebrating we didn't die somewhere in between. I know that's kind of morbid, but it's true. Think about it. When you get my age, you start celebrating with a little more vim and vigor. You thank God one more time around, right, Dick? God is eternal. The other thing about that I love, Caitlin, is that he knew me before anything was ever. He already knew me. Now, God isn't like you and I. We tend to think of him as a, as a gray-haired, bearded guy up on the, you know, dripping iced tea, rocking on heaven's gate. That's not the way he is. He's not, he's, in fact, he's transcendent. He's other than us. God is omnipotent all-powerful. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Not like you ask him a question that pops in his head. He knows before you ask. 
So he knows everything about me. When he chooses me, and I love this thought, I had this idea. When, I, when, when God chose Tom Johnson, <laughs> he was not buying a lottery ticket. He wasn't taking a chance. Some of us live as if we're going to disappoint God at any minute. Therefore, we don't want to get too close. We don't want to get, we don't want to get all in because then when we fail, we've got to be all out. We don't want to be a hypocrite. People tell me that all the time. I don't, I don't do this because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Dude, you're already a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites. We play at life all the time. We make nice to people that we really don't want to be with. We put a face on. We play a part at work because we think people want a certain thing. We don't want to be hypocrites. God already knows everything about you. Quit not trying to be a hypocrite and just say yes. God omnipotent, omniscient. He knows me. He is everlasting, undiminishable. Another characteristic is his goodness. He's not good because he puts his good foot forward. He's not good because, oh, I, you know, I got to put my best suit on. He is good because that is his character, his nature. In him there is no variableness, no shadow of turning. There is no evil of any kind, no wickedness, no deception. <laughs> I could go on and on. They're there for you. I hope you'll take a few moments. Just Google them. Google can help you with this and, and, and help you understand what these different terms mean if you're not familiar with them, and I'm sure you're not. That's okay. You're going to be as we continue studying God's Word together. But God's truth, listen, God's truth is the only antidote for the deception of this world, which keeps changing opinions and Everything changes, but it's the only thing that will set us free. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, he said, listen, cast your cares. No, he said, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Don't worry. You don't have to worry that you're not going to please him. Just release to him. Peter says in chapter 5, he says, just roll your cares over on him. You're not embarrassing God. He's not going to say, oh, I didn't know that about you. He says, offer it to him because he loves you and be called. he called you. Now, listen, I have either wrote a sermon much longer than I anticipated or <laughs> I preached much slower than I anticipated. Both are probably true. But I want to get to the big idea number two, and that is this, and I want you to help me with it again. God not only chose you, which is very important, but he's also not stuck with you. God chose you, Pam Tyndall, but he's not stuck with you. You ever choose that one kid, you were that, you know, on the baseball field or whatever, and you, you know, you saw something, oh, he, he looks like he could really, she looks like she could really hit that ball, and you, and you get him up there and they whoosh, miss the ball every time. You think, wow, I got, I got stuck with you. No, man, God's not stuck with you. He never regrets what he's done because he knew everything right up front, right from the beginning. So God not only chose you, but he's not stuck with you. That should eliminate right there the enemy's attack on your mind. Let's look at the, some of the last verses of this passage uh, in 1 Peter verse 18 and 19 and this is where i'm going to start just wrap it up for you so peter says this he says uh, for now you know that god has paid a ransom to save you for you know that god has paid a ransom to save you you know that was the blood of jesus he goes on to say that here in the scripture he says, I'm going to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid for with mere gold or silver, which loses their value. It was the precious blood of Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now, one more little piece of theology I want to 
share with you, and then I'm going to close, a promise. Sometimes when we read this passage or we hear someone talking about God ransomed us, we immediately go to the latest FBI you know, series that we've watched, and someone gets kidnapped, and they're holding someone hostage unless they pay the ransom. You know the scenario I'm talking about? And so we kind of get this idea that maybe one day God... He got all the blood of Jesus together and he presented it to the devil to pay a ransom because the devil had us captured and we were his hostage being held. And that would be a reasonable assumption based on what our worldview is and based on what, how little we know about God, really, and especially if you watch TV. But here's the reality of that, and I love this truth. It's very important that when Christ died on the cross, God received the blood. In fact, you remember I talked about this on, 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 on Good Friday, how when Christ died, the, there was a curtain that was split from the top to the bottom that was split wide open that had before that had separated people from the throne room of God, the earthly throne room where there was the Ark of the Covenant and the lid on top of the covenant seat there was called the mercy seat. And once a year, the priest would drop blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the people. And God just ripped that curtain wide open. And, and in heaven, the blood of Jesus was applied to the mercy seat of God. And that curtain being ripped open signified that from this time forward man would no longer be held captive would but would be able to enter into the presence of God here's what I want you to understand in your mind you've been thinking all this time God paid a ransom to the devil to free you but here's what happened God accepted the blood of Jesus as an atonement a covering that's what the word atonement means a, a ransom for you and I to deliver us not from the devil but to deliver us eternally from the wrath of God it was a holy God who had been offended by man's uh, man's uh, <clears throat> decision to sin against him, man's decision to turn and to eat of the fruit. It was God who was offended and God who stepped back, which allowed then the God of this world to fill that void. God allowed that to happen, but on the moment the blood was applied to the heavenly, eternal, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, when he was crucified, he forever took your place the Bible says God's wrath was poured out against him so that you would be able to receive the acceptance and the love of an eternal father. God choose, chose to ransom you, chose you, chose me, and he delivered us from the holy and just wrath of God so that we could receive his unmerited favor and grace. Now, that's some good news right there. That's some good news right there. And I pray that that would help you this morning, that you would get that to your heart. The blood of Jesus ransomed you from the wrath of Almighty God. God is not stuck with you. He is not angry with you. He's not sitting up in heaven saying, I love him, I love him not. I love him, I love him. He's not sitting up in heaven and saying, who let that kid in? That's not the heart of the Father at all. Brian, I want you to know that God loves you with a deep and everlasting love. It's not based on what you're ever going to do for Him. And it's not impacted by anything you ever did before or anything anybody ever did to you. That doesn't stop. It doesn't slow. It doesn't impede the merciful love of God. Are you with me? Now, here's the final big idea. This is the whole thing, and I want you to remember this if you forget everything else I say today. And that is not only did God choose me, and that he's not stuck with me. But listen, I want you to realize that you are his and not your own. He purchased you. He ransomed you. And you and you receive him. You no longer are your own to choose your own way. But you simply say, God, I will follow you. And he will do the rest. Let's bow our heads for prayer. I hope this has encouraged your heart. And I want to encourage you. We need to pray right now. And I, actually, I want to pray uh, from the Scripture. Romans chapter 3, Paul said this. And a, he, he said this to, his, to the people he was writing in, in a prayer. And I want to pray this prayer with you. And so if you'll just open your hearts to receive this. Father God, in your grace, 
you freely make us righteous in your sight. Oh, think about that. You did this through Christ Jesus when you freed us from the penalty of our sins. That's what the blood did. Freed me from the penalty of my sin. Freed me from the wrath of God. Freed me from any stronghold the devil would have over me. Any opportunity. I'm no longer in his kingdom. I'm in a different kingdom. I'm in a different kingdom. I have a different righteousness. God's righteousness. I am his. You are his. He chose you. He's not stuck with you. He ransomed you. He paid for you. You are his and not your own. Mm. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. God, because of this people, all people, every people can come to you. Even those in this room, Lord, or those watching online, we can come to you freely and be made right with you, God. Father, when we believe, when we believe and we receive, everything changes. We don't have to understand. We don't have to start doing, God. That comes in time. But, Lord, if we will exercise the gift of faith that you give us and say, yes, I believe. Father, that sacrifice shows us, Lord. It shows us, it reminds us that you cared for us, that you love us. Lord, even that being fair, you could have judged us, but being merciful, you chose, God, to put that judgment upon Christ. You delayed your coming. You delayed the judgment so that we might know you. Thank you for that, Lord. And we receive that from you in the name of Jesus Christ. We receive that from you right now in Jesus Christ. Now listen, please keep your head bowed for one more minute, for one more prayer. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, He's calling you today. You're here. You might think, well, maybe I'm not one that's chosen. No, you're here. You're in this room. You're in this room. You you actually came. You wanted to hear something. You have a moment where you're thinking, well, what does God have for me? God is at work in your heart. You're here because someone invited you, but because God prompted and God brought you here today at this very moment. It tells me with all my heart, I believe he's calling you. So I have a simple prayer. We pray it every weekend, but pray this with me just as a starter prayer. Maybe for you, it's a restart prayer. It doesn't matter, but here's the prayer. It's very simple. Pray this with me. And let's all just pray it out loud. Jesus, come on, we can do that. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you died for me. Died on the cross for me. For my sins. And I have sinned against you, God. And I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. From this moment forward, I want to follow you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you help me just give the Lord some praise this morning? God bless you, Father. We love you. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer, there's a little handbook in the back of your seat, and we also have some people waiting. If, if that's you, there's some tables back here. Please take just a moment. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you. We want to help you take that next step. Would you stand with me? I just want to speak God's blessing over you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for joining us online. Really appreciate that. Sorry we had those troubles in the beginning, but that's all settled, so God bless you. Get a chance to listen to this later. It'll help you again. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you, God, that you brought us together this morning. And now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to speak God's best blessing over you. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May you experience the smile of the Father all throughout the week. Remember, he chose you. He's not stuck with you. He paid a price for you. You are his and not your own, and he's going to take care of you. And finish the work that he started in you in Jesus' name. When you leave here, remember you're the head, not the tail. You're chosen for his good pleasure in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being with us today. I look forward to seeing you next week or maybe during the week sometime for prayer, Wednesday night, 630. Love to have you in that small group.